Absolutely don't get into online dating, because you might end up meeting a vicious rapist. Susan welcomed Teabag into her home, and her daughter instantly adored her mom's new boyfriend, as they joyfully played digital games together. Susan, gazing upon this tender scene, began to envision the bliss of a family of four together, and it was from this moment that Teabag genuinely experienced the joy of having a family. He wished to leave his dark past behind and fully immerse himself in Susan's family to truly reform and become a good person, until Susan saw on TV that this man was actually wanted for the rape and murder of six students. She was instantly shocked. After calming down, Susan quietly called the police. As a result, Teabag was arrested, sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. In prison, Teabag wrote countless letters seeking forgiveness, even though it was Susan who had reported him, because it was the only person he'd ever loved or even wanted to change, but he'd never gotten a response from Susan. Now, Teabag had successfully escaped from prison and had swallowed the entire $5 million the escape team had unearthed. He changed into decent clothes, holding a bouquet of sunflowers, and returned to Susan's old home, hoping to start over, but upon opening the door, Teabag found the place completely abandoned, with memories of the past flooding back in the empty room. However, as Teabag turned around, a brick was fiercely thrown at him. The assailant was none other than the former prison guard captain, Bellick. After being abandoned by the Michael brothers last time and left penniless, Bellick had planned to ask his mother for money to take the bus home. But then they saw on TV that Jeanette had been kidnapped and the garage was in disarray, indicating Michael and the others had found the loot. After discussing, they decided not to go back. So, they disguised themselves as officers and immediately went to Jeanette's to inquire about the whereabouts of Michael and others. The hundred dollars was Teabag's deliberate show-off, making a special trip back just to stuff it into Jeanette's chest. Only then did they learn that Teabag had absconded with the money. As the former prison guard captain, Bellick easily found out how Teabag was imprisoned and how he had written to Susan seeking forgiveness. Therefore, Bellick tracked him down using the mailing address. They tied up Teabag and demanded to know where the five million dollars was. Where you stash Westmoreland's money, or I'm gonna pluck you like a chicken, stitch by stitch. But Teabag, who had gone through so much to secure the money, wouldn't just hand it over, thus, Teabag was tortured by Bellick and Roy all night but still refused to talk. As Teabag took the chance to escape, a key from his trouser leg suddenly fell to the ground. He leaned over and picked up the key, immediately shoving it into his mouth. It turns out that just before Teabag came to Susan, he quietly deposited the money in one of the motel's public lockers. The key he swallowed was meant to open that locker, left with no alternatives. Bellick and Roy had no choice but to wait for Teabag to excrete the key. On the other hand, after discovering they had been swindled out of $5 million by Teabag, Michael and Sucre harbored thoughts of killing Teabag, but there is nothing they can do now, because the message from the intercom is that the police are searching for them. Fortunately, Teabag still had a shred of conscience. As he took the $5 million, he left a few hundred dollars for the others. Michael and Sucre purchased a used car, planning to head to the rendezvous point with Lincoln before attempting to flee to Mexico. Before that, Sucre made a call to his brother to inquire about his girlfriend, Mary Cruz. Unexpectedly, Mary Cruz hadn't married Hector, she had a change of heart right at the wedding venue. It seemed Mary Cruz still deeply loved him. Overjoyed, Sucre no longer desired to flee to Mexico but decided to take the risk to find Mary Cruz. With Michael's blessing, they parted ways. Michael, heading to the meeting point alone, was encircled and pursued by the police. Continuing like this, he would eventually get caught. With two days left until his meeting with Lincoln, Michael decided to take the initiative to investigate Mahone during this gap, believing in the strategy of knowing both the enemy and oneself. Michael gathered a vast amount of information on Mahone, then bought a decent outfit and posed as an FBI agent conducting a background check for Mahone's promotion, visiting Mahone's ex-wife Pam's house. Curiously, although Mahone clearly loved his ex-wife and child, it was unknown why he chose to divorce. Digging deeper, it was revealed that this was all because, years ago, Mahone encountered an extremely intelligent criminal, obsessed with capturing him. Mahone focused all his efforts on the task. Until a year ago, when there was no more news of the criminal, Mahone suddenly relaxed, and Mahone had purchased a bunch of random lie, tinkering in his garden daily, not allowing anyone close. After analyzing, Michael speculated that the criminal had likely been captured by an almost paranoid Mahone and then his body was whipped and buried in his backyard. 
The lie was intended for destroying the evidence. Before leaving, Michael stole Pam's phone and dialed Mahone's number. Michael hoped Mahone would stop pursuing him. Otherwise, he would expose the body in the garden. But Mahone flatly rejected him, as he was facing both internal and external troubles. The coincidence of two escaped prisoners dying under his pursuit, coupled with Mahone's past of violent law enforcement, led the Internal Affairs Department to investigate him quickly. Sir, uh, there's a phone call for you. I'll take it later. Uh, sir, you're going to want to take this now. Luckily, Mahone had a powerful backer, Kellerman, which was why he remained in scathe. And Kellerman was backed by President Caroline. Since the escape team had been with Lincoln for too long, they inevitably knew some inside information about Lincoln being framed. So they all had to die. Mahone obeyed Kellerman because Kellerman also knew about the body buried in Mahone's backyard. Meanwhile, Lincoln, while taking LJ to the rendezvous point, was indeed captured by the government's men. But on the way back, a van rammed the police car and several people came out, directly taking the father and son away. Come here! Let go of me! Okay, calm down. Calm down. My father! You try that again. Who the hell are you? We're on your side! We're with your father. They were brought to a secret location, where LJ finally met his grandfather he had never seen before. Aldo's subsequent words made Lincoln realize that he was just a minor piece in this grand scheme. Bellick placed a colander on the toilet and then stripped Teabag's pants down, forcefully pressing him onto the toilet bowl. To prevent Teabag from escaping, he tightly bound him with tape. Bellick did this because Teabag had just swallowed the key to a locker containing $5 million in stolen money. To expedite the process, Bellick even had Roy purchase laxatives. After completing these preparations, the two vigilantly stood guard outside, eagerly fantasizing about living the high life with the $5 million. Their persistence paid off, as a torrential release heralded the key's arrival. Teabag finally expelled it. Get the stool. What stool? The stool. Roy inwardly sighs that every time something good happens, Bellick are the first to get on it, while he's relegated to the front line to do the dirty work. However, for the sake of five million dollars, Roy temporarily swallowed his pride. The duo then tied Teabag, a wanted criminal, to the radiator and called the police. Despite Teabag's pleas, it was to no avail. He was now of no use to them. Minutes later, the sound of police sirens approached, sending Teabag into a frenzy of desperation. If caught, he knew he would never again leave prison alive. Teabag glanced at his recently stitched severed hand and, in a grim resolve, bit through the sutures. By the time the police arrived, the place was deserted, leaving behind only a severed hand in the corner. Meanwhile, Bellick and his accomplice had reached the motel and successfully retrieved the $5 million. He's always the first to go when something good happens. Overwhelmed with excitement, Bellick rushed to check the money in the bag. Unaware that Roy had quietly pulled a hammer out of his pocket. All that green. It's prettier than Grand Canyon. Hey, that's the most beautiful thing you ever seen. Oh. Hand over the bag, Brenda. I'm not kidding around. Oh, you think you're Pandy Ann? Unbeknownst to him, the hunter became the hunted. Roy emerged as the ultimate victor in life. He moved into the most luxurious presidential suite and ordered three ladies of varied allure. From the plump to the slim, the tall to the short, blondes to brunettes, he had it all. But as Roy turned to grab the money, he realized there was a GPS tracker in the bag. Before Roy could react, the ferocious tea bag broke in. A terrified Roy hastily begged for mercy, claiming that the idea to torture Teabag was all Bellick's and offering to split half of the money with Teabag. But it was too late. The ruthless Teabag ended Roy's life with a wine bottle. By then, Bellick had awakened from his unconscious state. A female officer came to inquire, but Bellick was at a loss for words. He couldn't possibly admit to trailing to Utah for the $5 million only to have his colleague abscond with it, so he concocted an excuse. After the police left, an enraged Bellick called Roy. Thieving son of a better get down on your knees and pray to God that I don't find you. Because if I do, mark my words, I'm gonna gut you about a stern. However, upon leaving the hospital, he encountered Roy's body being brought in. Mr. Bellick? Yeah. Do you mind answering a few more questions? At the police station, Bellick realized he couldn't hide the truth any longer and divulged some self-serving information. Unbeknownst to him, the police had already accessed recordings of his threats to Roy. Moreover, 
Roy's stay in the presidential suite was charged to his credit card. Bellick and Roy's collaboration had always been financed through his credit card. After killing Roy, Teabag deliberately left the spending records at the scene. Now, Bellick had no defense. With a clear motive, the police promptly arrested him. I did not kill Roy Gary! You understand what I'm telling you? Bagwell, set me up! Get your hands off of me! Bradley Bellick, you are under arrest for the first degree murder of Roy William Gary. You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and to have him present with you when being questioned. If you cannot hire a lawyer, the court will appoint one for you. From then on, Bellick completely fell from being a guard to becoming a prisoner. Sarah had just returned home to find her father, the governor, hanged from the door frame, in her haste to take him down. She didn't notice a key falling to the ground. She checked her father's pulse, only to find he had been dead for some time. Soon after, the police arrived and preliminarily ruled Frank's death a suicide. As the guards were outside and there were no signs of forced entry, but Sarah refused to believe that her father, who had just been nominated for vice president, would choose to end his life without any warning. After the investigators left, she discovered a key under her backpack, one she had never seen before. However, Sarah was too distraught to concern herself with the origin of the key and pocketed it before dragging her exhausted body back to her place. But upon opening her door, she was shocked to find syringes and morphine scattered on the table a clear sign someone had broken and intending to stage her overdose suicide. Before she could process this, an agent appeared behind Sarah. Miss Tancredi, <laughs> why didn't you startle you? What the hell are you doing in my house? I'm so sorry for your loss. Realizing he intended to kill her, she quickly made sure to fight back, leaving marks on her body so the police would not believe it was a suicide. But her assailant had already planned for this. Apparent attempt to avoid jail time. The governor's daughter skips bail and disappears. You're talking about your last minutes, Miss Tancred. Please don't do this. That stuff on the table is premium. Confused and panicked, Sarah stumbled upon a can of insecticide. Seizing the moment, she managed to escape and found a public phone booth to call her father's colleague for help. However, as Sarah hid in the corner awaiting rescue, a beautiful woman with a similar build and hair color happened to come to the public phone booth to make a call. Unexpectedly, this woman was mistaken for her and shot dead in the street. Realizing she could trust no one, Sarah hurriedly removed her phone's battery. Desperate, Sarah finally thought of Michael. Since his escape, Michael had sent her several encrypted letters, deciphering them. Sarah learned that Michael wanted her to meet him in a remote town soon. After many days, they finally met outside the prison for the first time. However, Michael's next words chilled Sarah to the bone. I've arranged for us to get to Panama. We're meeting up with my brother tomorrow. Wait, that's your... plan? Although she still loves Michael deeply, she can't accept being on the run with two of America's most wanted criminals, especially since her current predicament is a direct result of Michael. After venting her frustrations, a car seemed to approach from afar. The man was FBI agent Mahone. During Sarah's escape, Kellerman, who had intentionally gotten close to Sarah, discovered the encrypted communication and then handed it over to the highly intelligent Mahone for decryption. Mahone had successfully tracked them to this location. They fled to a nearby factory. With Mahone following, gun in hand, Michael knew he was there to silence them, doubting they could escape alive this time. In a critical moment, Michael spotted a gas pipeline valve and hatched a plan. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Alex. You smell that? It's propane. It's filling the room. And if you pull that trigger, we both die. After a verbal duel, Mahone found himself at a loss against Michael and could only watch helplessly as Michael made his escape once again. After escaping danger, Michael and Sarah arrived at a safe motel to tend to their wounds. Seizing the moment when Michael went to freshen up, Sarah chose to silently leave. Because Michael himself was in danger, Sarah did not want to follow Michael to live on the run. However, reconsidering that she, although not a fugitive, was also being hunted and she couldn't bear to part with Michael, Sarah chose to return. But just then, Kellerman, who had been tracking her, appeared before her, on the other side. Aldo finally revealed the true reason behind his son being framed. Aldo, like Kellerman, was once part of a mysterious company, led by a man named Bill. Caroline's presidency was secured by the company's removal of all obstacles, controlling the U.S. government and manipulating policies while conducting operations the government could not officially sanction. As the company's actions grew more outrageous, Aldo, not wanting to be complicit, 
took some critical documents and fled, to force Aldo to surface. The company framed his son, Lincoln, for the murder of Stedman and sent him to prison, they never anticipated Michael would successfully break Lincoln out. If the framing of Lincoln were proven, President Caroline would be forced to resign. To prevent the spread of this information, the company sought to kill Lincoln and anyone with first-hand contact, including all eight escapees from the prison. Aldo only now shared this because his team had just secured vital information, a national security agency analyst, delving into a high-level surveillance program accidentally overheard a phone call between President Caroline and her supposedly dead brother, Stedman. The analyst was horrified. Lincoln's execution for the murder of Stedman, who is still alive. Is that not a conspiracy? Therefore, the analyst took the tape and mailed it to Frank. This became the direct cause of Frank's death and Sarah being hunted. Aldo was certain the tape was with Sarah, for the company would not relentlessly pursue her otherwise. With this recording, Lincoln's innocence would be undeniable and they could seize the opportunity to move against the president and the company. While discussing, they were oblivious to the presence of a mole in their midst. The mole hurriedly made a call to the leader, Bill. Moments later, the company's assassin arrived, skilled and unobstructed, but the sound of a bullet casing hitting the ground before entering alerted Lincoln. He immediately had everyone hide and then tackled the assassin, disarming him. The struggle became intense. The assassin, being a professional, grabbed a kitchen knife and lunged at Lincoln. Fortunately, one of Aldo's men ended the assassin with a shot. At that moment, the assassin's phone rang, and the caller was Bill. Just like anyone else you said to take out my son. We want you. This isn't about LJ. There's a very simple way for all of this to end. I'll tell you how it's gonna end. Me staring in your dead eye with my hand around your throat. 